Hello and welcome to this very special edition of Indianomics. I have with me an expert who can speak with authority on many major economies in the world as well as the global economy. Yes, your guess is right. I have with me the chief economist of IMF, Pierre Olivier Gurinchas. Dr. Gurinchas, who is here at the invitation of the NCAR, delivered a scintillating speech on the geo-economic fragmentation in the world and its likely impact on growth and other macros. Sir, Dr. Gurinchas, sir, thank you for giving time for us and thank you for NCAR for getting you here. Thank you. Okay, let me start with uh, the growth picture itself. Both IMF and World Bank actually upped the global growth numbers. Uh, what's your sense of uh, both growth and inflation for the world economy in, say, the next 12 months? Yes, well, we have a picture where growth is holding steady in 2023, 2024, 2025, around 3.2% annually. So that's a reasonable performance. It's not a stellar performance. We've done much better as a global economy uh, in the first 20 years of this century, closer to 3.8%. So nothing to brag home about yet. But at the same time, let's point out you know, that we are doing better than maybe we were expecting a year ago or a year and a half ago, especially when inflation was starting to rise, central banks were tightening interest rates around the world, there was an expectation that there would be a major slowdown, there could even be a global recession. We haven't seen any of that. Instead, what we have is inflation coming down, growth holding steady, and we are more or less on a path towards a soft landing. Okay, and we got endorsement of that from Jerome Powell. Uh, he seems to have just suggested at a central bank forum that uh, he is he acknowledged the disinflation and said he's not yet confident enough to cut. But what's your best guess? Is it one this year as the market seems to be pricing in as the dot chart indicated and quite a few next year or is it one and a long pause? Well, in our um, April projections, uh, we already flagged that the disinflation process in uh, a number of countries, but including the U.S. especially, was showing signs of slowing down. There's been quite a bit of inflation persistence, in particular in services, and that is calling into question the speed at which inflation is actually going to come back to target. So from that perspective, back in April we're flagging this as a risk. Now we're saying that yes, there is indeed a bit more persistence. Inflation is taking a bit more time in the U.S. to come down. So it's entirely appropriate in our view that the Federal Reserve would be saying, look, let's, let's hold this a little bit longer, let's wait, let's make sure that inflation is indeed coming back uh, towards uh, central bank targets before we embark on, on a cutting cycle. But uh, this confidence of uh, not just a soft landing, but probably a very good soft landing has sent the indexes soaring as, you know, uh, the S&P above 5,500, NASDAQ above 18,000, uh, the S&P has hit record highs 32 times this year, you know, and the average of five times every month. Is there some financial risk hidden in plain sight? Well, we, let's remember where we were a year ago. Uh, so a year ago, um, a little bit more than a year ago, we had the banking turmoil in the United States. We had uh, the Credit Suisse in Europe. Uh, so we were very nervous back then about um, how well the financial system could handle this rapid increase in, in interest rates by central banks and especially we were concerned about the health of the medium-sized banks in the US and elsewhere. And a year forward, you know, now in July 2024, what we're seeing is the financial system has been quite resilient. In the central banks, the regulators, they've all taken action to try to make sure this doesn't turn into something worse, but it's been handled fairly well. So yes, there is, uh, uh, in a sense, equity valuations are strong. Uh, some spreads are remain, uh, remain quite tight. So financial conditions are still relatively easy. And that's something that, in a sense, may have complicated a little bit the task of uh, central banks around the world, because when you tighten policy rates, you expect that financial conditions will also become a little bit tighter as well. And this has not happened as much this time around. Uh, but I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a major risk going forward. This is something definitely to monitor. One possible reason is the fisc is not tightening much, at least in the US. Uh, you know, we are, we are still staring at 8% and maybe more, uh, depending on election results. Uh, anyway, what is your best guess about how yields High fisc would mean high term premiums. So what's your best guess about, say, the 10-year, since everybody's benchmarked to it 
and yeah. about the dollar index. Yes. We, we've been we've been seeing uh, an increase in term premia in, in the U.S. and elsewhere, and and some of it could be coming from the fact that there is indeed uh, a number of countries have been running uh, quite substantial fiscal deficits. I mean, certainly in the context of the U.S., it would make a lot of sense when you have an economy that is running very close to potential unemployment is close to 4%, uh, the economy is growing robustly, uh, it would make a lot of sense not to have any amount of fiscal stimulus, quite the opposite, to have a little bit of retrenchment, consolidation on the fiscal side, and that's certainly been, been our advice here. Now, the U.S. is not in any uh, uh, situation where uh, its uh, fiscal situation cannot be handled. It, it has a lot of room for adjusting, but some of the adjustment uh, would be welcome at this point. Now, those are the BAU questions. Let me uh, take off now from the uh, geoeconomic fragmentation that you spoke about in the T.N. Srinivasan uh, lecture. Everywhere, France, UK, uh, even in India, the incumbent has come back with a smaller majority. It is likely to go away, in, I mean, likely to be changed in other countries. And if that happens in the US, there is a very real danger, as you pointed out, as all the speakers in the India Policy Forum at NCAR point out, a very real chance of tariffs rising. And if that is the case, will you rethink inflation levels? Is there a second supply shock? Well, so there is certainly a sense in which a number of countries are now turning inwards and are putting in place measures that are distorting trade. Now, some of it are justified on reasons of national or economic security. Some of, some of them are justified on other grounds. Uh, and that's something certainly to watch very carefully. And we at the IMF were certainly very much in favor of an open trading system, uh, one that abides by the multilateral rules that we've put in place, organizations like the World Trade Organizations. So we certainly favor a more open, uh, open trading system because that's one that has really delivered fantastic growth at the global level and has helped lift hundreds of millions of people out of, uh, out of poverty. So we are seeing, with some concern, the emergence of a number of these measures that are looking inwards, maybe starting to distort trade, maybe uh, moving towards some form of reshoring. Sometimes we hear reshoring, French shoring, uh, etc. These measures will uh, make international trade harder. They will reduce efficiency gains. Some of them might improve resiliency. So there is something to be said also about improving resiliency. But, but they are likely to increase cost. There might be a modest impact on uh, uh, production cost and therefore on prices and therefore there might be a little uptick in, in terms of inflation pressures. But at this point, we're not seeing a huge impact in that direction. What we're more concerned about is how it might impact productivity growth, standards of living going forward for the global economy. Oh yes, no, the financial markets probably are pricing in uh, tax cuts. You know, we are seeing um, this corporate uh, uh, earnings probably getting revised higher, which is why the markets are behaving the way they are. Now, if that were to happen, there are financial market implications if, you know, taxes are cut. Uh, would you worry, therefore, that this fisc problem is not going away that early? Which means, well, how do you look at yields and dollar index if this overhang persists? Well, let's take the, your question purely from the monetary side first. So, so if I think about, and we we're talking about the fact that some countries like the US may have a slower disinflation than maybe what they've seen last year, and therefore they might delay a little bit more uh, their uh, uh, easing cycle. And as a result, uh, interest rates in the US might remain higher for a little longer. And that will put pressure on other currencies. That's, uh, that will mean sort of a stronger dollar. There will be capital flow out of a number of countries into, into the US. So we know that this has uh, this kind of impact on, on, on the global economy. And certainly, if anything happens that would stimulate even further uh, the US economy or advanced economies in general, that would in turn create more inflation pressures. And then it would require that central banks uh, tighten further, which would increase further these pressures on, on currencies, especially in countries that are at the different phase of their cycle. A number of emerging market economies may be at a different phase of their cycle. Some advanced economies also are at a different phase of their cycle. So they could benefit from cutting rates starting to ease uh, uh, pressure on the monetary side, but they might be concerned about how much their currency might depreciate and how much imported inflation they get through that channel. Yes, I know I'm facing, uh, putting you across uh, situations which are binary and hypothetical, but we live in such times. 
Uh, let me turn to China now. Uh, in China, we have seen huge disinflation. The uh, uh, central bank is worried about the way in which bond yields are falling. Uh, but what is your sense about China's impact on the world? Will it be a disinflationary force? And yet the commodity markets are telling us that commodity prices are likely to be higher. So, you know, what would your advice be to central bankers uh, to gauge China? Well, certainly China has a major impact on global markets. It's an economy that's uh, really a, a very large economy. Uh, and, and therefore, anything that happens there in terms of domestic growth will have spillovers. And we are seeing that right now. We're certainly seeing export prices coming out of China that are decreasing uh, 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 and not increasing. Now, this is an economy that uh, where growth has slowed down. Now, the good news there is that compared to our uh, April projections, uh, we've actually, in uh, the latest uh, uh, data we have for China and their Article 4, we actually have uh, revised upwards our, our growth pro uh, projections for 2024 to 5%. Um, from uh, from 4.6 percent, so there is a little bit more growth momentum in in China in 2024. That's coming on the back of a little bit more spending by the government that's stimulating consumption and also good performance on uh, on the external side on, on net exports. Uh, now it's certainly the case that a fa more faster growing Chinese economy would be good and beneficial for the world. Uh, right now we are still concerned about some weakness in domestic demand coming in particular from the property sector crisis that they have that is not fully resolved. The government has taken some action, it's going in the right direction, but maybe not enough yet to turn the page. Dr. Kuna, just let me stop you there. We need to take a commercial break but have lots more questions on China and India for Dr. Gurinjas back in a jiffy. <laughs>